is our mighty fortress. Amen.
has lost its grip for me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Death has lost its grip for me.
some wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul can take it in on the cross that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin oh then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration. serve a great God. Let's pray together. Father, you are great. Lord, we, we thank you for the privilege that we can come and gather as your bride this morning and worship you. Lord, thanks for a building that we can come and worship you in and, and serve you in. Lord, we love you. You are truly great. Lord, what is man that you are mindful of him? Lord, thanks for your son. Thanks for sending him to be our Savior and to love us. We love you. Lord, you are a great God. And it is in your name that we pray this morning. Amen.
Well, great worshiping with you guys. You guys can turn and greet each other this morning. Carl, so you know that's trouble. <laughs> well, uh, for the parents in the room, do you guys know what day it is? <laughs> Graduation Sunday, come on. The day we've all been looking forward to. And I know we at least have one of our seniors in the room. Yeah, it's you. Come on up. We have Zach and Coy. Are you here? Coy? Coy? Well, sorry, Coy, I guess uh, I get to keep this, so. All right. So here at Elevation, we love our students, and uh, you're graduating. So we've got, you want to help me with this part, Carl? All I right. do. Do you want to ask the question? I do not. Okay. So I'm going to ask you very, very quick questions. Uh, this is something that we do at youth group, and uh, you're going to have to answer them as fast as you can. Sound good? All right, here we go. Ready? What's your name? Zach. What school do you go to? Uh, Skyview. What is your favorite superhero movie? <laughs> Batman. I don't know. Ah, uh, he said the Batman, I believe, right? That was a good one. All right. Uh, what we would like to do this morning is we're super proud of you. I'm proud of you. Elevation's proud of you. I believe Roger's proud of you. <laughs> he gave a thumbs up. So we're all super proud of you. Great job. We would like to give you this gift it is, you are going to use that for the rest of your life. I love that Bible. Carl, I was talking to in the back, loves that Bible. It is a study Bible. It's going to have all sorts of great tools for you, and uh, you're going to use it for the rest of your life. Thank you. So we're going to pray over him as a church really quick, uh, just praying that uh, God will continue to look out for you and uh, that we will also be able to come around and look out for you. So if you could please uh, bow your heads with me, church. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for Zach. Thank you so much for all of the other seniors that we have at Elevation Church. We pray blessing over them. We pray that you will look out for them and continue to look out for them as you've been so faithful to us already. Jesus, we pray that this church will be able to continue to come around him in his next stage of life. And that whatever may come, that he will always know to turn to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, dude. Give it up a little louder, or I'm going to get louder. There you go. Good morning, Elevation Church. Real quick, two things, and then we'll jump into the announcements. Number one, guys, when Peyton's on stage, you have to remember that he deals typically with personalities that are from 6th grade to 12th grade. He doesn't have a whole lot of uh, adult time in his life, and so he's accustomed to wild behavior and responses, and so if we don't give him that, he's going to get a little hurt, okay? He's a sensitive young man, and so when he comes up here, we need to be boisterous and vibrant. Deal? Secondly, to you, sir, that book that you were just given is one of many that you will be given in a short time in your life. It is hands down the most important. It transcends all. Study it, learn it, know it, love it. It will serve you well. All right, now on to the announcements. So we're still doing the Levy bottle drive. Um, right outside the doors, there's a table with some baby bottles on it. You grab them, and it's the easiest fundraiser in the world. 
I'll show you why. You take the bottle, you set it like on your nightstand, or if you're like me and Logan and stuff's just scattered everywhere, pick the spot that's empty on the counter. And then at the end of the day, when you're cleaning out your pockets, you just take the little change, no abracadabra, no wand, and you just keep doing that, right? And then when it's full, you bring it back to the church, not to Levi directly, bring it back to the church, turn it in. Um, and they've been doing this fundraiser for years. It can be really, really awesome. I want to remind you that Levi does a lot of things. They're not just uh, an abortion-focused clinic or, or anything like that. They do free STI and STD tests for people all the way down to physicals, sports physicals for uh, young folks that are trying to get uh, into sports. So let's rally and support them. Those bottles are in the back. Next week, when? Next Sunday, when? <laughs> Some of us were in first service. We have one service next hey, Sunday. Matthew. It is at 10 o'clock. What time? 10 so if you show up at 845 for the 9 a.m. service, you'll probably get let in. You'll probably get put to work. <laughs> Do not come at 845 expecting church to start in 15 minutes. You need to be here at, if you attend the 1030 service next week, you will be 30 minutes late, which means you will probably be judged very harshly, ridiculed in public. There may even be some shunning. Be here at 10 o'clock next week. All right, so I get these notes uh, from Derek early in the week, and my next note is celebrate trivia night on Friday. We had a fundraiser for the youth to go to camp on Friday night. And I really wanted to celebrate it. I was pumped. I talked to Peyton this morning, and the numbers, honestly, we could have done better. Okay? So I'd like to celebrate the people that did come, and I'd like to celebrate Paul Garbett in this awesome outfit but I think we can all agree that if we weren't there to witness it live, then we fell short not only for our youth, but also for our longevity ourselves, okay? There are going to be some more fundraisers coming up. As a church, we can come together. We can do better, yes? Awesome. Okay. Next steps. There's a card in the seat back in front of you. If this is your first time with us, as you can tell by the banter up here, we are not the same as every church in town. We want to get to know you. We want to have relationship with you. We are about community here. If this is your first time here, fill that card out. And at the end of the service, walk up to somebody in a black shirt that says next steps on it. Trade that card in for a free gift. We want to give you a handshake. We want to say hi. And we want you to know somebody. That's all we ask. Um, lastly, we come to a time of giving. There's five easy ways to give here at Elevation. You can give in person. There's some boxes in the back to drop your best off. You can do it online at elevationbillings.com, by mail. I'm not going to explain how to do that. Uh, text 84321, or you can automate giving to make it easier for you. So let's pray. Father God, um, we come this morning humbly before you of people that are just amazed by the leadership that you've put around us, guys like Peyton that have such a heart for teenagers, Lord, and, and we just pray that you would continue to grow that ministry and continue to, uh, to, to facilitate him pouring into our young people. Father, I pray for uh, him as he gives a message today that it would be your words through him and none of his own, and that no person that leaves here today would leave without having an encounter with you. In the mighty name of Jesus, everyone pray. Amen. That's pretty intense.
Huh? Well, don't worry. I'm the youth pastor, so it's going to be one of those sermons. <laughs> My name is uh, Peyton, and before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you to Pastor Roger really quick for giving me this chance to be able to bring the word to you guys today, because uh, I love this church. I mean, it is hard to believe that my wife and I have only been here 11 months because it feels like we've been here forever, and that's all thanks to, yeah, who's right? And it's all thanks to you guys for being so welcoming. So, Freddie told me that uh, this should be a fun sermon because you guys might not know that much about me, so I decided, you know what, why not start this morning with something that I love, and I love a good two-for-one deal. You... Don't even, like you guys aren't all suckers for a buy one, get one. Come on. As Roger says, shame the devil, tell the truth, church. Uh Uh-huh. Now, you know how I know it? Because I know there's items in your guys' house that you did not want or need. But because you got a free one with it, you bought it anyway. Because I know that's the case for my wife and I. And see, we are suckers for the best deal in town right now, in case you did not know. It is the Dairy Queen Blizzard. It's true. The Dairy Queen Blizzard, Dairy Queen right now has, when you buy something from their store, you will get on your receipt a coupon for a free blizzard. Someone's mouth's wide open, and that's the appropriate response. (laughs) Yes. The problem is we found ourselves in an endless loop because we'll go to Dairy Queen, and we'll uh, buy a blizzard, get our free blizzard, and then get a receipt for another free blizzard. So what do we do? We go back the next day, and we've got a blizzard, a free blizzard, and then a receipt for another free blizzard. I haven't stopped eating Dairy Queen for four months. I need help. (laughs) Now, I think the reason that I love what we're going to read about this morning so much is because we get a two-for-one deal this morning. We're going to read about a two-for-one miracle. That's right, two for the price of one. That's pretty sweet. But before we get, so this morning we're going to be in Mark chapter 5. If you guys want to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. Now, while you guys are turning there, I would ask that you guys follow along because we're going to be going verse by verse. And you're going to want to bring your Bibles to church. And honestly, you guys should be in the habit of bringing your Bibles to church. Because not bringing your Bible to church is a lot like going to the bathroom without your phone. Some of you guys in here totally get that because your wife yells at you just like she yells at me because I spend too long in the bathroom. But when I have my phone, that's like a solid hour of reading time, at least, at least. Trips to the bathroom without your phone are pretty empty. Just like when you come to church, it's going to feel pretty empty. So turning your Bibles to Mark chapter 5, if you need help finding that this morning, ask someone next to you. But really quick, we are going to be Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you're in some weird names... That's Old Testament. Just keep flipping. Just keep flipping. Okay, before we get into this story, one more thing. I kind of want to set the scene for us today. Because Jesus' ministry is in full motion. The disciples have been assembled, and Jesus just got done with what I would call a pretty busy work trip. Jesus had just traveled from Capernaum by boat to Decapolis. On his way there, you guys might remember, that's when he calmed the storm. That was pretty cool. Well, while he was in Decapolis, he won up it by, uh, telling, or by casting out a legion of demons out of the demon-possessed man into all the pigs. And that was pretty amazing. Right after that, Jesus gets back in the boat and travels back to Capernaum. You guys tracking? Capernaum, Decapolis, Decapolis, Capernaum. I practice that so much. <laughs> so this takes us to verse 21. So go ahead and get your Bibles out. Here we go. Verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, underline that title, rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. This guy, Jairus, is a very big deal. He held the position ruler of the synagogue. Now, I know you guys might be thinking, that sounds pretty important, and that's because it is, but maybe you don't know what that is, so I called Pastor Roger this week, and I asked him, I said, hey, Pastor, is this 
similar to the position of maybe a youth pastor. <laughs> and he told me that, uh, no, rulers of the synagogue had a lot more responsibilities and worked a lot harder. So that kind of hurt my feelings. But, I mean, it's kind of true. Your, your responsibilities would be overseeing the affairs of the synagogue. So you would oversee the services, organize the teachings, maintain the schedule, and if the teacher was missing, you would step in and teach. Now, we don't know this next part 100% about Jairus, but nine out of ten times, rulers of the synagogue were Pharisees, you know, the guys that didn't really like Jesus. Interesting, right? Now, I do not believe that Jairus went before Jesus this day as ruler of the synagogue. I don't even think that thought crossed his mind. I think that Jairus came before Jesus this day as a father, desperately trying to do anything he can to save his little girl. And I do not want us to miss the scene that the crowd must have been seeing this day to see Jairus on his face before Jesus. You see, Jairus understood something, that it takes tremendous faith to understand your dependency upon Jesus. Listen, church, our job title does not matter. What we've accomplished in this world does not matter. Because in the end, we are all helpless without Jesus. Jairus was a very important man, and even he understood that he was completely dependent upon the Savior. Now, I could do a whole sermon on just Jairus and his faith, but what I want us to focus on this morning is just that little last or first bit of 24 that we kind of quickly read. It's, and he went with him. Point number one this morning is this, that Jesus was not too busy for Jairus. Jesus said what I would just call a pretty taxing work trip, right? I mean, that's a lot of travel. My wife and I, we just got back from South Carolina. We drove all the way there, and we drove all the way back. And I'm telling you right now, if there was a crowd of people on my front porch when I got home asking me to do a whole bunch of stuff, I would have got right back in my car. But not Jesus. Jairus was desperate, and he is coming to Jesus here as a desperate man, and Jesus shows him compassion. Jesus was not too busy for Jairus, and I want to remind each and every one of you this morning that Jesus is not too busy for you. No matter what lie you have been told, no matter what you believe, Jesus is not too busy for you. 1 John 5.14 says this, and in this and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We can have confidence this morning knowing that Jesus hears our request. That he loves us enough to listen to the unspoken and the spoken request. Have you guys truly tried to wrap your head around that? That the creator of everything, that holds everything in his hand, has the time to listen to you and me. Jesus is not too busy for you. Okay, verse 25. There's so much good stuff in here. We're going to keep going. Back up really quick, 24, excuse me. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and had suffered, and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. I want to set the scene here a little bit, because here it is, everybody, that two-for-one miracle that I was teasing a little bit earlier. See, Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus' daughter, and he gets interrupted by this woman, this woman who has been sick for 12 years, this woman who has been hemorrhaging, bleeding for 12 years. This woman had spent all that she had, right? It says right there. She'd been going from doctor to doctor, just trying to find a cure, and no one could tell her what's wrong with her. She was a lost cause. Not only could they not help her, but if we read at the end of that verse there, it says that she was growing worse. Now, the pain that she must have been in, the discomfort that she had must have been terrible. But what I think is the worst part about this woman's situation, we can only see if we dive deeper into the text. You see, this woman was unclean. 
And I'm not talking that she was just messy or something like that. No, according to the Old Testament, according to purity law, she was ceremonially unclean. This can be found in Leviticus 15, if you want to write that in the footnotes of your Bible for later. And in there, it sums it all up. It's saying that she would not be allowed in the temple. She would not be allowed to go out in public without announcing that she was unclean. But the worst part, the worst part would be that anybody that touched her would also be considered unclean. That means that this woman most likely was not touched for 12 years. You would, you would steer clear of this woman anytime you saw her because as far as you were concerned, she had the plague. She had Rona, but you'd give her a lot more than six feet. This woman was alone. She was messy. She was a lost cause. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Like 12 years without hugs, without high fives. I mean, I'm a big fan of a fist bump. No more fist bumps. I mean, some of you introverts in the room might be saying like, heck yeah. Get these people away from me. I don't get to talk to anybody. Like, let's go. But could you go without a hug for 12 years? 12 years is a very long time. But the best is yet to come. So we're going to keep reading. Verse 27. She had heard reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd. And underline this, touched his garment. For she said, if I even touch his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was clean. She touched Jesus. If this is your first time reading this, it is okay to gasp. She touched Jesus. What's she even doing here? What's she even doing in the crowd? She's not supposed to be here, right? And now she touches Jesus. That would make him unclean. But that's not what happened, is it? No. It says circle, highlight, underline, star, whatever you want to do. Immediately, immediately she was healed. Our next point this morning, church, is this, that nothing is too messy for Jesus. Jesus is greater than any purity law. This woman reaches out and touches Jesus, and instead of making him unclean, he makes her clean. No mess in our lives is too great to overcome the power of Jesus. Because the truth of the gospel is this, right? That Jesus stepped into our messy world. Jesus stepped into our messy lives to save us. And Jesus was not corrupted by this world, and sin did not defeat Jesus. No, Jesus defeated sin and death, and all he asks is that we deny ourselves and follow him. Amen? There is no sin or shame that we can carry that is too messy or shocking for Jesus. So don't think for a second then that you are too messy for Jesus. Verse 30. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, immediately turned in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? Uh oh. If you're the woman, your throat just jumped all the way out. Not in the throat, it's gone. And the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Jesus was not done with this woman just yet. He still had one miracle to work in her life. I mean, in her head, she's probably thinking, I'll get in, I'll get out, no one will notice me, Jesus won't notice, I'm not even supposed to be here. But that's not how Jesus works, is it? No, Jesus still had one more thing to do. And just like Jairus, here's our first parallel point for this morning, Jesus was not too busy for the woman. Jesus takes the time to seek her out. Jesus takes the time to hear her story. And then Jesus does something amazing, right? Jesus calls her daughter. The woman who has been called unclean for the past 12 years was just called daughter by the Son of God. Jesus totally could have kept walking this day. He could have let her get her miracle and got out, but instead he stopped and he did something amazing. He welcomed her into his kingdom and he called her his own. 
Jesus was not too busy for the woman. And again, again, I want to remind you that Jesus is not too busy for you. But there is a lesson to be learned from both the woman and Jairus in this story. Both Jairus and the woman took a step in faith towards Jesus and reach out to him. And Jesus asked us to do the same thing, right? Our relationship with Jesus requires effort. It requires us to take a step in faith towards him and reach out to him. So our first step when times get tough should be to reach out to Jesus. Okay, back inside this story. You're Jairus. You just watched Jesus basically hip bump, or watch this woman hip bump into Jesus, and now she's healed, right? Pretty incredible. You're probably feeling pretty good. Like, this was amazing. Just imagine what he'll do for my daughter. But that celebration doesn't last very long. Read with me in verse 35. While he was still speaking, this is Jesus. While Jesus was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. Parents in the room, I know that this news would bring you to your knees. To know that you were so close. Jesus was right there, but you were too late. And it's a lost cause. And then Jesus looks at Jairus and says, do not fear, only believe. I don't know about you guys, but I don't, I don't have children yet. But if I lost a child and Pastor Roger came up and told me, do not fear, only believe, man, I'd probably slap him as hard as Chris Rock. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that, right? And you want to know something? I know I'm not alone in this feeling. That if somebody came up to one of you and said, do not fear, only believe, you probably wouldn't feel very comforted, would you? And yet we still have the urge to do it anyway. We still have the urge to comment thoughts and prayers on someone's Facebook post. We still have the urge to comment, God works for the good of those who love him. Don't worry. That's a horrible way to try to comfort someone. No one wants to hear that. But Jesus tells people that all the time, Peyton. Well, I would like to quote a very wise pastor who once said, you ain't Jesus. That's Pastor Roger. <laughs> Stop trying to hold the same authority that Jesus does and start trying to love like Jesus does. Because when Jesus tells Jairus, do not fear, only believe, he is making a statement. He is saying, I am not done yet. The best is yet to come. And when Jesus tells us, I am not done yet, there is authority behind those words. Only Jesus has that authority because only Jesus sits on the throne, and we don't. So stop trying to hold the same authority that Jesus does and start trying to love like Jesus does. All that being said, I want to tell you this morning about hope. We should all take hope when Jesus says, I am not done yet. Now, listen very carefully. We've been talking a lot about heresies the past couple weeks, and this is not a prosperity gospel message. I am not saying if you have tremendous hope and tremendous faith that you will be healed. No, I'm saying that we as believers need to put our hope in something that is greater than our current circumstances. Our hope should be in Jesus. The greatest hurdle in your life the greatest obstacle that you could ever face that you had no way of defeating was defeated by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we put our hope in Jesus, we put our hope in the eternal, because guess what? The best is yet to come. And the best is yet to come in this story. So let's keep reading. Verse 37. And he allowed no one to follow him except for Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making such a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Really quick side note. The crowd laughs at Jesus here, and I find that interesting. Because this crowd is made up of professional mourners. Their job was to show up at funerals and basically kind of help with the grieving process. Didn't matter if you were rich or poor, you'd probably have a professional mourner there. 
So they were only called in when someone died. So when Jesus says, she's not dead, she's just sleeping, they find this pretty funny, right? They got a good laugh out of it. And it will all be fun and games until Jesus proves them wrong. Time and time again throughout scripture, Jesus proclaimed that he would die and three days later rise again and crowds mocked him until Jesus proved them wrong. The world that we live in constantly mocks Jesus that will be proven wrong. Do not be one of them. Because Jesus is exactly who he says he is and Jesus did exactly what he said he was going to do. And, and, he's coming back do not let Jesus prove you wrong come judgment day. Let's keep reading. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother, those who were with him, and went in where the child was. Underline, circle, highlight this part. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this. And told them to give her something to eat. Two for one miracle. Jesus brought Jairus' daughter back to life. But it's the way that he does it that we need to pay close attention to this morning. Taking her by the hand. Because this parallels what Jesus just did with the woman. Numbers 19.11 tells us that anybody that touches a dead body would be... That was pretty good. Unclean unclean. So Jesus is once again showing us that he is greater than any purity law. And once again, our parallel point, we are reminded that nothing is too messy for Jesus. To touch Jairus' daughter would make him unclean, but Jesus flips the script one more time. Rather than her making Jesus unclean, he makes her clean by giving her life. In this moment, Jesus is showing not only that will he overcome uncleanliness, but he will also overcome death. Does this sound like a foreshadow? Yes? Oh, man. Well, I was telling staff that this, I love this story so much because it's kind of like you get to look through a peephole and see the whole gospel in just this story. I mean, here we see Jesus show his compassion. We see Jesus show us how much he loves us, that he steps into our mess. But there's one more point I want to conclude with, one more parallel that we can't miss. And maybe you guys have picked up on it. This woman that was bleeding was a lost cause. Doctors gave up hope. She was getting worse. She had thrown all of her money at a cure and nothing was working. She was a lost cause. Jairus' daughter was sick. He had nowhere else to turn. His little girl was dying and then eventually died, and his friends came up to him and told him, give up hope. She's dead. It's a lost cause. Let me tell you, church, with Jesus, there are no lost causes. And that is our final point this morning, that there are no lost causes in Jesus' eyes. This woman was not beyond Jesus' reach. Jairus' daughter was not beyond Jesus' reach, and that's because nothing is beyond the power of Jesus Christ. Now, this point right here is crucial for us today. Because if there are no lost causes in Jesus' eyes, we all need to be very careful that there are no lost causes in our eyes. Every single person that walks through the door of Elevation Church is not a lost cause to Jesus. Every single person that we interact with at the gym, at the mall, I don't know who goes to the mall anymore, but <laughs> at our work is not a lost cause for Jesus. If Jesus never gives up on people, we should not be a church that gives up on people either. And I know I've used this excuse, and I've heard this excuse from people before. I just have this one coworker. They're never going to come to church with me. Or I just got this one family member. They're kind of trouble. They're beyond saving. I've given up. Those are horrible excuses, let's be honest. Because Jesus did not think that you and I were beyond saving, and Jesus did not give up on you and I. There are no lost causes with Jesus, so there better not be any lost causes with us. And I have a way that we can live this out today. 
a challenge for you guys. We announce every Sunday that there's this invite card. Yeah, you guys know it. This invite card in the seat in front of you. And that's nice. You know, it's nice that we announce that. It's nice that we want people to come here. But this Sunday, I don't want it to be a suggestion. Take an invite card and bring that lost cause in your life to church. We have had these invite cards for three years. We have not needed to place an order for invite cards in three years. So let's hand these out this week. Let's give out so many that we have to order more by next Sunday. No one is beyond receiving an invitation to be a part of this congregation, and no one is beyond receiving the opportunity to hear about Jesus. Let's be a church that does not see people as lost causes, and let's be a church that offers hope that is only found in Jesus Christ. We serve a really big God. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for Elevation Church and the blessing that it has been to my wife and I and many people in this room. Lord, thank you for this story. Thank you for the miracle that you worked in the life of Jairus and the woman. Thank you for the lessons that we've been able to draw out of this passage this morning. And I pray that we can be a church that boldly goes out and proclaims the good news and invites people to join us each and every Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, can we say thank you to Peyton? Great job, buddy. Hey, y'all, I just got a few quick announcements, a couple things I want to say before y'all stand up and get out of here. The first thing is, this is a fun one, we got softball games like all day tomorrow, church softball. It starts at 6.30, we got one at 7.45, we got one at 9 o'clock. Y'all just come out to the park and spend like the whole day watching baseball with us. It will be a real hoot. Here's a couple other ones I want to throw your way, which by the way, I love that we have the background music for church softball. That makes it very nice, very awesome. Hey, Carl already hit on this. Really important. We want to support La Vie. We, we say this all the time around here. The, the topic of abortion, it is not a political issue. It's a holiness issue. And we stand with life. Our church, who we are, we are, we are pro-life. We want to protect every kind of baby. And we're not, we're not ashamed of that. We will say it. We'll scream it from the roof. I, I want to say this, too. I want to say this. My hope is... Uh, isn't just that abortion is abolished in the state and in the country. That would be great, but that's not my only hope. But that God would change the hearts of the people in our country, that we would think, who would even consider such a thing? It's great if we could abolish it, but God change our hearts. That's what I would really like to see. And so we support Levy, we stand with Levy, we have their back. Y'all fill this thing up with some coins, some money, some checks, whatever it is. Drop it off here at the church and uh, let's, let's bless them and knock their socks off. Let's do that. Then the last thing I want to say, this is a big one. I mentioned this, uh, gosh, about a month or two back, but I, I told you guys we started the adoption process for our little boy, Salty, and uh, got some good news. Things moved rather fast, and not this Thursday, but next Thursday, we're going to finish this thing off, and we officially get to adopt that little guy, so we're super excited. And I... No, so many of you, y'all have encouraged us, uh, especially in the first year when things were just really rough. You even took that little guy and, uh, and allowed Jess and I to get some sleep, which, I mean, you're lifesavers for us. You've been praying. You've come alongside of us. We thank you so much, and we want to we wanna say thanks to you, and we want to party like crazy. So next Friday, we're going to adopt him Thursday, and then next Friday, Friday, June 3rd, we are going to have an open house party here at the church. So Friday night, y'all are invited. Y'all are invited to come, and uh, someone asked, her, like, should we bring cards or anything like that? Don't bring cards. Don't bring anything. Just bring you. Eat our food, okay? Just show up. We're going to have dinner. Eat all our food. That guy, that little boy, he loves sports, so we're going to have, like, ping pong tables and cornhole and all kinds of stuff out there, and just show up. Give him a little pat on the head. Eat our food and celebrate with us, so circle, highlight, underline that date on your calendar. Friday, June 3rd, and let's party. Love you guys. Encourage Peyton on the way out. See you next week. Make good choices.